All right. Um, first of all, I want to say how excited I am to be speaking in Slovenia. We spent two weeks in Ljubljana a few years ago. Love this country. We had an amazing time. So thank you very much for having me come and speak in your amazing country. Just wanted to get that out. Um, so I talk about marketing and building marketing into the product. My company is Hunter and Bard. You already talked about that. Here are some of our clients. We're going to keep going. That's me. He already told you all about me. We don't need to go there. Um, this is where you're going to be able to find the deck afterwards. So you do not need to um, take a bunch of pictures or whatever. I'll post it online. So what do I do? We do marketing, OK? In this particular situation, it was a company that had um, a lot of social, and the social was going to a commercial YouTube channel. Only another social was optimized. Um, the person who was there before me had a background in SEO and SEM. And instead of doing any type of reciprocity with the animators whose work we were posting onto the commercial YouTube channel, um, he wouldn't give anything to them. If they wrote in and asked for something, the answer was basically no. I came in, changed our methodology of engagement, and changed our views and doubled our income uh, from the commercial YouTube channel. Uh, what to learn from this, anytime that you have the chance to build somebody else up, you get reciprocity from that. They will work to build you up. So that's something that you need to understand about marketing. Now, about how I talk. I like to talk with the audience and not at you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I am very used to this. In Israel, it usually takes about 30 seconds to a minute to get the first hand up. I watch the audience, OK? Um, and so please, don't hesitate to ask any questions. Now, I have a light on me where it's kind of hard for me to see you, but it's not impossible. And I do watch the audience while I'm speaking. So don't hes hesitate to ask any questions. All right. What are you looking for? Well, you've got a startup. You're looking for product market fit. You're looking to build a business. And build a business that's going to last and be successful. All right? So you've got to find, figure out how you're going to be doing that. We're going to go through these things today. You're going to find that I'm going to skip through a lot of slides because they're slides that you could actually read later. And I'm going to um, stick on certain points as I watch your faces and I see who's looking like they've got a question or not. OK. <laughs> so when does marketing start? Marketing starts the moment you conceptualize the product because you have to figure out, is this a product that somebody wants? Okay? As Mark was talking about earlier, the original product was something that nobody wanted. They only had 10,000 users, and they needed a lot more than that. So they didn't think about the actual user and the end product. It was too complicated. You have to think about the marketing. You're going to think about who is the user, what is their pain, and why are we doing this from the very second you start conceptualizing the product. And then marketing for the concept phase, you start to get to know media, um, media you start to get to know media people, OK? You go onto Twitter, you start to get to know media people, and you start to research the area. Um, you give a lot to these media people. You don't, OK, so you're going to think to yourself, when you finally launch, you're going to have PR. And for this PR, you're going to have to get media people to actually cover you. So how do you do that? Well, you get to know them on Twitter. And when you get to know them on Twitter, you don't ask for anything. You just give, OK? You don't come to them at the last second and say, oh, look, here's my product. Uh, write about it. Because they won't. They don't care about you. They don't know who you are. And they have a whole bunch of other people coming to them at the same time. So instead, you get to know them for about three to six months. You just write to them nicely. And then finally, when your product is ready, you say, look, we're doing this in a week. You know, would you be interested in checking it out? And if they like it, they're going to write about it because that's what they do for a living. So you, know, you don't have to worry about that bit. You, the ask is, are you willing to look at it? And you don't order. You ask. OK. Um, you could also check your messaging with ads to landing pages and all of that. Testing your idea for the web, well, there's a million things that you could be doing. You can do ads to landing pages, and you could take it where you take them all through the buying process, all the way to even inputting your credit card. And then if you don't actually have the product ready, you could say, well, we'll charge you in six months when the product comes out. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you could be doing. And these are different ways to test if you actually have an idea that people are interested in. When it comes to the apps, it's a little bit of a different story. Because with apps, you have to come out with a fully fleshed product in order to optimize what you've got inside of the app store. So what you have to do for an app, the way you test for an app is to, well, launch it in a single country in Europe, say Slovenia, in Slovenian, and test to see how users are using it and what people are doing. And when you finally get to product market fit, and product market fit is 40% retention of people using your product on a regular weekly basis, OK? So when you get to product market fit, when 40% of your 
when your user base like, would be really, really unhappy if you were to go away tomorrow. So when you get to product market fit, you know you've got a good product, you get it fully fleshed, and then you launch it worldwide. And you put also a lot of money into the marketing because the way the App Store works is the first time you launch it, you get like a lot more juice for each download than you do when you come up with a release or, or something else afterwards. So it starts at eight usually, or eight for the first couple of hours, then it goes down to six, then it goes down to four, then it goes down to two, and the first 48 hours are the most important when you launch an app. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, alpha phase. You could start building up. If you've got an app or a product or whatever that's in a certain market space or area, you can start to blog about it and start not about your actual product because nobody's interested in your product, but they're interested in their own pain point. So if you start to give helpful information in that particular area, they'll will follow your blog and you can get people interested in what you're doing and then you build up your newsletter list. That newsletter list is who you're going to actually send a newsletter out to when your product is launched and by doing that, you're able to already have a user base when you first start out. So that's a way to get things started before you even launch. With launch, all those media people that you got to know before, this is when you do that week before and you say, hey, are you willing to check this out? So that's when you do that then. Um, send an announcement, everything else. So everything that you have to do in marketing and everything you have to do with your business anyhow has to be related to strategy. What is your end goal? What are you gonna be doing in order to get that done? And what's the metric? You don't have to take a picture, the deck will be up. <laughs> I told you, I watched the audience. Okay, um, an example of that is blogging. Why blog? So you've got your business objective, you want to improve financial performance. You're spending too much on ads. The problem with ads is, well, the great thing about ads is that you know people are gonna come in. The bad thing about ads is that you're constantly spending money on it, okay? And once the ads stop, so do the people. So let's say you want to lose the dependence on the ads. You end up doing, the, um, your business metric is to, lose the dependence, you start blogging. And from that blog, you end up getting more organic traffic. The organic traffic goes up. When you stop blogging, you still have all of that, all of those user, or all of those keywords already in Google. So you've got that Google juice for a while longer. And it lowers your costs. An example of that is Fujicate. They basically started a movement, and this was with an app. Um, content marketing for an app isn't typical, but it actually worked really well because they had an app that had to do with a movement, changing the way people eat. Um, single marketing strategies for web, you could look at that later. Performance measurement, you could look at that later. Product market fit. Okay, like I said before, 40%. That's what you want to get to. Now, as Mark was talking about before, yeah, question. Oh, thank God. <laughs> it's working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you said blogging as yeah. a solution, right? Yes. Uh, don't you need to advertise as well for blogging? Because I keep blogging and blogging and blogging and <laughs> the, the visits are not growing. Okay. So when you blog, you have to let people know that you are blogging. How do you do that? You guest blog and you guest post. And you write a how-to and you post it either in TechCrunch or the next web. Then they do that little bio bit. That bio bit tells people about your blog. You post blog, if you're doing something on growth hacking, you post it on growth hackers. You post it on Hacker News. Do you guys know what Hacker News is? Y Combinator has Hacker News. You want to look this up. Um, you also want to look up growthhackers.com. Okay, that's Sean Ellis's site. So if you're interested in, in getting people to your work, they have to actually know that it exists. So depending on what you're writing about, you find the industry publications that are relevant to it, you ask if you can guest post, and from that guest post, they can bring juice over to your blog. You're welcome. So, yeah. Um, at the center of everything, back, at the center of everything, you've gotta have a good product, all right? If you don't have a good product, bad marketing, oh, good marketing will kill a bad product faster than anything else. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you've got a really, really amazing marketing and it goes to a product that nobody likes, everybody comes in, checks it out once, leaves, and never comes back. Getting them to try it again is really, really, really difficult. So you have to keep that in mind. The great product has to be at the center of it. Now, you've got different types of marketing, okay? Earned Media and PR has about a 40% trust rate. Um, ads has about a 14% trust rate. And relationship marketing has about a 70% trust rate. So relationship is word of mouth. That's, yes, question. And another question, <laughs> back there. 
Hello. Hi. Uh, Goran, CEO of Hi. So at the beginning, you <laughs> mentioned to get in touch with journalists uh, by Twitter. Yeah. Can LinkedIn also be used for that? I don't think they check their LinkedIn that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just from personal experience. But they're pretty much all on Twitter. And they're on Twitter fairly regularly, and they all follow each other on Twitter. So when one person's, and you can also see what they're interested in, you know, and you can actually get in conversations with them so you can build a trust rate. So, you know, it's, it's just easier to get a hold of them. They don't really look at LinkedIn. Um, back to this. So, great question, by the way. Um, so relationship marketing has about a 70% trust rate. So relationship marketing is anything that you opt in for. It's somebody going to your website or somebody, um, or being told from a friend or um, seeing something on Facebook, um, things that they decide to go into. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I would like to ask uh, for blogging. Yeah. In Slovenia, it's not uh, so common you, in use, blogging. Yeah. How to write a blog that it's useful? Well, you have to think about the industry. Okay, so how do you, well, first of all, don't write about yourself. Yeah, I know that. Nobody else is going to find that interesting. So, um, <laughs> it's true. Okay, I mean, you find it interesting, your mom finds it interesting, but nobody else does. So, um, so other than that, you think about the industry. And what pain points do you have in your industry? Yeah. yeah. But people do doesn't read blogs in Slovenia. They so do. Well, well, maybe they don't read them in Slovenia, but I'm assuming that your product's going to go outside of Slovenia. Um, and maybe they're not reading them in Slovenia because they're not interesting. So if they're really well written, people will read it. And if it's an interesting topic, people will read it. So what are people reading? And then write accordingly. And also give them really helpful information. You build up reciprocity that way as well. And you lower the, um, you extend the customer lifetime value. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, with mobile marketing, it's a little different in that you've got App store optimization, ads and localization are probably the biggest ways to grow it. Um, you've got earned me earn media, that's reviews, PR, and then social integration, that's how easy is it to share from the app that you've got. Social doesn't get people into your app as much as it simply gets them to get to know that your app exists. That, you could look at the editor. I already talked about this. Oh, no, one thing. One thing about PR to keep in mind, now PR gives you a nice rush because you get to see your numbers spike when you get into a really good publication. So your numbers go up and you get this rush and you're like, oh my God, I'm so excited. And then the numbers drop and then it dies. Okay, that's what PR does. It just gives you the initial, like people know that you exist. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to stay. It takes a while to actually get them to trust you and decide that they're going to stay. Um, with affiliate, uh, uh, blah, 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 affiliate SEO media buy, it's what I said before. You pay for it, it goes away when it's done. Uh, relationship marketing. Oh, one thing to keep in mind about affiliate. So for affiliate marketing, you have to vet your affiliates really, really well. They don't care about anything but the money that they're making, so they don't care about your brand. If you do affiliate marketing wrong, they'll destroy your brand. Um, relationship marketing takes time. Time is money, so it does cost. Okay, behavioral engineering. It's my favorite bit. Now, simplicity changes behavior, what does that mean? BJ Fogg has an equation. It's behavior equals motivation, ability, and trigger, all right? You can't change somebody's motivation, that's theirs. Now when you're building a product, the only things that you could do is their ability. He, Mark talked about having a really complicated product, ability wasn't there. And what's the trigger? What's the trigger to get them to actually come and use your product, okay? So this is what ends up, this is how you need to think when you're doing your marketing, when you're doing your product. Now the trigger could be, um, the trigger could be getting an email, the trigger could be getting a notification, the trigger could be finding out about it on Facebook or on Twitter or on LinkedIn. The trigger could be anything. The ability, you have to make it easy. T-shirt economy, reputation economy. There was at Google, they, this is a case study from my MBA days. I have an MBA from Kellogg. And, uh, and in this, case study, it was a Google case study where they had, um, I keep thinking of the Hebrew word, they had a, the Hebrew word is bolsa, hold on, stock market. They had a stock market when, um, <laughs> they had a stock market for when projects were going to be finished 
And people who did really well on guesstimating when certain projects were going to be finished, they were using the wisdom of the crowds to come up with, um, to come up with the dates of when things were actually going to be finished as opposed to when the project manager said they were going to be finished. So, um, so people who were really good at guesstimating when things were going to be finished got awards. They got money, okay, and they got a t-shirt. Now, these are Google engineers, granted, but the general idea is once you have your basic needs met, money is not as much of an action trigger. Okay, but that t-shirt, when they forgot to give people the money, nobody asked for it, and quite frankly, they didn't really care. But when they didn't get the t-shirt, people were pissed. Where's my t-shirt? I want my t-shirt. I want to wear the t-shirt. It's a unique t-shirt that shows that I did this, and I want my t-shirt. Okay, that's a reputation economy. So think about it. Quora works that way. Wikipedia works that way. Stack Overflow works that way. There's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different products online that work through a reputation economy. People love to show off what they know. So this is a reputation economy. This is where your evangelists for your products, this is where they come from. You do not pay them. If you're paying an evangelist, they're not an evangelist. Okay, they're an affiliate. So. This is how you need to think. Somebody has to love it so much that they're going to wear the t-shirt. Financial economy, on the other hand, this is where you think about, well, you know, what's in it for me? Um, another example, another case study from my Kellogg days, is uh, there was a country somewhere in northern Europe, I never remember which one, and they did a test. And the test was, we have to put a, um, we have to put a nuclear power plant outside of the city. So they took two groups of people, same amount, did a normal test, and said, and said to one group, we have to put a nuclear power plant outside of the city, are you willing to have us put it there for the good of the country? And to the other group they said, we have to put a nuclear power plant outside of the city, are you willing to let us put it there for six weeks of your annual salary? Now to the group they said to the annual salary, 25% said yes. To the group they said to, for the good of the country, 50% said yes. People are more willing to do things for the good of others than they are for money. As soon as you put money involved, they start thinking, is this worth my time? Think about it. A lawyer would rather work pro bono than get paid less than they normally do per hour. If they start doing it at, for less than what they normally do per hour, they start to get annoyed. This is not worth my time. I could be doing you know, something else. I could be act making actual real money. And then they also, you know, but when they're doing it pro bono, they get warm and fuzzies, you know, because they're like, I'm doing this for the good of others and I'm doing it for free and this makes me feel good. It's a gift that I'm giving. So it also puts a different spin on it. So are you doing a financial economy or are you doing a reputation economy? Priming. This is such a great example. So, Takipi is um, an Israeli company, and that icon of the dog opens up to a picture of a dog. That's all. It's the office dog. Okay? Um, but they found that when they put that up and you do that first click, you're more likely to click on the Twitter and the Facebook icons. Because by doing that first click, you have subconsciously become somebody who clicks on icons. <laughs> and if you click on the icon, you obviously clicked on it for a reason, so then you're going to go through and join, or follow, or like, or whatever you have to do, right? So that's the, that's the reason why this exists. They found that when they added this icon, their, uh, their followers and their friends went up significantly on both networks, okay? This is priming. Priming is getting somebody to take an action that makes them more likely to take that action again. Framing. This is how you phrase things, how you do things. So how you frame things makes a huge, huge difference. You were talking before about the blog. You were asking about the blog. Where are you? So, there you go. OK, so you were asking about the blog. And you were saying, well, nobody in Slovenia reads blogs. Well, no, nobody in Slovenia has read uh, blogs that you know about yet. That doesn't mean they're not going to. It means that nobody's written one in a way that anybody's found it very interesting. So then how, how do you do that? What do you write about that's going to make it more different uh, more interesting for somebody else. The example I usually use for this, there was a, uh, I was mentoring in Sofia, in Bulgaria, and there was a company that was telling me about their product. We have an analytics product, it's for enterprise. And I asked them, does it do this, this, and this? And they're like, um, no, it doesn't do that. And does it do this, this, and this? No. So how are you gonna go after large enterprises 
when you guys aren't offering all the things that all of these other companies are offering and they have plenty of money so they could take those other companies instead of yours. And he's like, God, why does everybody ask me that? The VCs ask the same thing. And, and I said, all right, well, you know, there's a reason why you're doing this, so why? And he's like, well, there's this other market. He's like, there's these smaller enterprises and they don't need all that stuff. And these other products are too expensive for them. I'm like, so what you're saying is there's an underserved market and you have a product that fills their need. It's a completely different frame than saying we're offering a lot less for less to people who don't need it, okay? <laughs> so how you frame things matters, thank you. Um, loss aversion. Again, this is a way of framing things, okay? So in Italy, the points go down instead of up when you get a traffic violation. Um, why? Because they found that loss aversion was a stronger action trigger. When your points went up, they felt like they earned something and um, it made more traffic violations than less. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'll know how many geeks are in the room by who gets this. If you've read Harry Potter, you'll understand. Yes, no? Oh, come on, people. <laughs> All right. So um, I was going through mixed panel, uh, and I was looking at a client's analytics, and I started looking at their, their how-to section. Um, Nimbus 2000 is from Harry Potter, the broomstick. Okay, it's the broomstick that Harry Potter wants. And this is an Easter egg. And this is a way, when you're going through it and you see it, you feel closer now to the product because you feel included. Okay, you're included into a club that you know not everybody's going to get, and, uh, and it's, an, it's referred to in English, or at least in American, as an Easter egg. Achievement, I love this. Power user status achieved. You're all out of notifications this month. Pay us and we'll give you more. Okay, this is, this is a great, great way to get people to buy. So I, I, use, um, I use this product, it's, I can't remember the name of it, it's from HubSpot, Signals, I think it's called. And, uh, and, you know, I use it religiously, and then when you get to the end of it, you're like, they're like, okay, you've used enough, pay us, and I will end up paying them because I use it so regularly. But this is a way to get people to pay you without really, you know, it's, it's like you've achieved something in order to get there, so it makes you almost feel good to be paying them. Okay, so once people actually start using your product, how do you get them to come back and share? So, this is probably the most important slide of the deck. Again, it'll be on SlideShare, so don't worry about it. You don't have to picture it. Everyone, okay, these things on the side are just examples, but everyone has an action trigger, all right? Reward, status, achievement, self-expression, competition, altruism, everybody's got one. My usual example for this, and I think you're gonna get this from the discussions that were on in the very beginning of the day, the differences between two cultures. I'm gonna talk about Israel versus Germany, okay? In Israel, um, actually I'll go German first. Germany is status oriented. They like their cars, they like their watches, they like their clothes. If you have a startup and you failed, you will never get funding again. They are completely afraid of failure. Failure is a bad word. And so they don't take risks. All of their companies are me too's. Okay, almost all. Nearly all of their companies are me too's. Only now are there a couple VCs who have had multiple exits who are trying to fix this in the, company, in, the, in the country. But this is the attitude. And parents are trying to get their kids to, you know, go to an enterprise job. And the newspapers are talking about our economy's too good and that's why we have no innovation. Okay, um, so that would be Germany. Israel, on the other hand, is achievement oriented. We've got over 60% higher education. Um, we've got over 60% higher education. If you've had an exit, the first question somebody is asking you is when you're doing your next startup. There is no getting an exit, having enough money where you never have to work again and not working again. People would think you're insane. Is there something wrong with you? Why would you, what, you're gonna stay, you're gonna do what? You're gonna go rest, you're gonna travel. You're not gonna travel. You can travel for six months, but then it gets boring. You have to come back and start go back to work again. Okay, this is Israel. So, you know, if you've failed at your startup, well, did you achieve funding? Did you achieve a product? Did you learn from it? When are you doing your next one? That's what they, when are you doing your next one? And that's it. And the question's always asking me, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing your own startup? 
it's, you know, it's always, why aren't you going to achieve more? And, and that's the difference between the two cultures. It's the difference between the mindset. They so do. Well, well, maybe they don't read them in Slovenia, but I'm assuming that your product's going to go outside of Slovenia. Um. And maybe they're not reading them in Slovenia because they're not interesting. So if they're really well written, people will read it. And if it's an interesting topic, people will read it. So what are people reading? And then write accordingly. And also give them really helpful information. You build up reciprocity that way as well. And you lower the, um, you extend the customer lifetime value. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, with mobile marketing, it's a little different in that you've got app store optimization, ads and localization are probably the biggest ways to grow it. Um, you've got earned, me earned media, that's reviews, PR. And then social integration, that's how easy is it to share from the app that you've got. Social doesn't get people into your app as much as it simply gets them to get to know that your app exists. That, you could look at the editor. I already talked about this. Oh, no, one thing. One thing about PR to keep in mind, now PR gives you a nice rush because you get to see your numbers spike when you get into a really good publication. So your numbers go up and you get this rush and you're like, oh my god, I'm so excited. And then the numbers drop and then it dies. Okay, that's what PR does. It just gives you the initial, like people know that you exist. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to stay. It takes a while to actually get them to trust you and decide that they're going to stay. Um, with affiliate, uh, blah, 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 affiliate SEO media buy, it's what I said before. You pay for it, it goes away when it's done. Uh, relationship marketing. Oh, one thing to keep in mind about affiliate. So for affiliate marketing, you have to vet your affiliates really, really well. They don't care about anything but the money that they're making, so they don't care about your brand. If you do affiliate marketing wrong, they'll destroy your brand. Um, relationship marketing takes time. Time is money, so it does cost. Okay, behavioral engineering. It's my favorite bit. Now, simplicity changes behavior. What does that mean? BJ Fogg has an equation. It's behavior equals motivation, ability, and trigger, all right? You can't change somebody's motivation. That's theirs. Now, when you're building a product, the only things that you could do is their ability. He, Mark talked about having a really complicated product. The ability wasn't there. And what's the trigger? What's the trigger to get them to actually come and use your product, okay? So this is what ends up, this is how you need to think when you're doing your marketing, when you're doing your product. Now, the trigger could be, um, the trigger could be getting an email, the trigger could be getting a notification, the trigger could be finding out about it on Facebook or on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Trigger could be anything. The ability, you have to make it easy. T-shirt economy, reputation economy. There was at Google, they, this is a case study from my MBA days. I have an MBA from Kellogg. And, uh, and in this case study, it was a Google case study where they had, um, I keep thinking of the Hebrew word. They had a, the Hebrew word is bolsa, hold on. Stock market. They had a stock market when, um, <laughs> they had a stock market for when projects were gonna be finished. And people who did really well on guesstimating when certain projects were gonna be finished, they were using the wisdom of the crowds to come up with, um, to come up with the dates of when things were actually gonna be finished as opposed to when the project manager said they were going to be finished. So, um, so people who were really good at guesstimating when things were gonna be finished got awards. They got money, okay, and they got a t-shirt. Now these are Google engineers, granted, but the general idea is once you have your basic needs met, money is not as much of an action trigger. Okay, but that t-shirt, when they forgot to give people the money, nobody asked for it, and quite frankly, they didn't really care. But when they didn't get the t-shirt, people were pissed. Where's my t-shirt? I want my t-shirt. I want to wear the t-shirt. It's a unique t-shirt that shows that I did this, and I want my t-shirt. Okay, that's a reputation economy. So think about it. Quora works that way. Wikipedia works that way. Stack Overflow works that way. There's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different products online that work through a reputation economy. People love to show off what they know. So this is a reputation economy. This is where your evangelists for your products, this is where they come from. You do not pay them. If you're paying an evangelist, they're not an evangelist. Okay, they're an affiliate. So. This is how you need to think. Somebody has to love it so much that they're gonna wear the t-shirt. Financial economy, on the other hand, this is where you think about, well, you know, what's in it for me? 
Um, another example, another case study from my Kellogg days, is uh, there was a country somewhere in Northern Europe, I never remember which one, and they did a test. And the test was, we have to put a, um, we have to put a nuclear power plant outside of the city. So they took two groups of people, same amount, did a normal test, and said, and said to one group, we have to put a nuclear power plant outside of the city, are you willing to have us put it there for the good of the country? And to the other group, they said, we have to put a nuclear power plant outside of the city. Are you willing to let us put it there for six weeks of your annual salary? Now, to the group, they said to the annual salary, 25% said yes. To the group, they said to, for the good of the country, 50% said yes. People are more willing to do things for the good of others than they are for money. As soon as you put money involved, they start thinking, is this worth my time? Think about it. A lawyer would rather work pro bono than get paid less than they normally do per hour. If they start doing it at, for less than what they normally do per hour, they start to get annoyed. This is not worth my time. I could be doing you know, something else. I could be act making actual real money. And then they also, you know, but when they're doing it pro bono, they get warm and fuzzies, you know, because they're like, I'm doing this for the good of others and I'm doing it for free and this makes me feel good. It's a gift that I'm giving. So it also puts a different spin on it. So are you doing a financial economy or are you doing a reputation economy? Priming. This is such a great example. So Takipi is um, an Israeli company, and that icon of the dog opens up to a picture of a dog. That's all. It's the office dog. Okay? Um, but they found that when they put that up and you do that first click, you're more likely to click on the Twitter and the Facebook icons. Because by doing that first click, you have subconsciously become somebody who clicks on icons. <laughs> and if you click on the icon, you obviously clicked on it for a reason, so then you're going to go through and join, or follow, or like, or whatever you have to do, right? So that's the, that's the reason why this exists. They found that when they added this icon, their, uh, their followers and their friends went up significantly on both networks, okay? This is priming. Priming is getting somebody to take an action that makes them more likely to take that action again. Framing. This is how you phrase things, how you do things. So how you frame things makes a huge, huge difference. You were talking before about the blog. You were asking about the blog. Where are you? So, there you go. OK, so you were asking about the blog. And you were saying, well, nobody in Slovenia reads blogs. Well, no, nobody in Slovenia has read uh, blogs that you know about yet. That doesn't mean they're not going to. It means that nobody's written one in a way that anybody's found it very interesting. So then how, how do you do that? What do you write about that's going to make it more different uh, more interesting for somebody else. The example I usually use for this, there was a, uh, I was mentoring in Sofia, in Bulgaria, and there was a company that was telling me about their product. We have an analytics product, it's for enterprise. And I asked them, does it do this, this, and this? And they're like, um, no, it doesn't do that. And does it do this, this, and this? No. So how are you gonna go after large enterprises when you guys aren't offering all the things that all of these other companies are offering, and they have plenty of money, so they could take those other companies instead of yours. And he's like, God, why does everybody ask me that? The VCs ask the same thing. And, and I said, all right, well, you know, there's a reason why you're doing this, so why? And he's like, well, there's this other market. He's like, there's these smaller enterprises, and they don't need all that stuff. And these other products are too expensive for them. I'm like, so what you're saying is there's an underserved market and you have a product that fills their need. It's a completely different frame than saying we're offering a lot less for less to people who don't need it, okay? <laughs> so how you frame things matters, thank you. Um, loss aversion. Again, this is a way of framing things, okay? So in Italy, the points go down instead of up when you get a traffic violation. Um, why? Because they found that loss aversion was a stronger action trigger. When your points went up, they felt like they earned something. And um, it made more traffic violations than less. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'll know how many geeks are in the room by who gets this. If you've read Harry Potter, you'll understand. Yes? No? Oh, come on, people. <laughs> All right. So um, I was going through Mixpanel, uh, and I was looking at a client's analytics, and I started looking at their, their how-to section. Um, Nimbus 2000 is from Harry Potter, the broomstick. Okay, it's the broomstick that Harry Potter wants. And this is an Easter egg. And this is a way, when you're going through it and you see it, you feel closer now to the product 
because you feel included, okay? You're included into a club that you know not everybody's going to get, and, uh, and it's, an, it's referred to in English, or at least in American, as an Easter egg. Achievement, I love this. Power user status achieved. You're all out of notifications this month. Pay us and we'll give you more. Okay, this is, this is a great, great way to get people to buy. So I, I, use, um, I use this product, it's, I can't remember the name of it, it's from HubSpot, Signals, I think it's called. And, uh, and you know, I use it religiously, and then when you get to the end of it, you're like, they're like, okay, you've used enough, pay us, and I will end up paying them because I use it so regularly. But this is a way to get people to pay you without really, you know, it's, it's like you've achieved something in order to get there, so it makes you almost feel good to be paying them. Okay, so once people actually start using your product, how do you get them to come back and share? So, this is probably the most important slide of the deck. Again, it'll be on SlideShare, so don't worry about it. You don't have to picture it. Everyone, okay, these things on the side are just examples, but everyone has an action trigger, all right? Reward, status, achievement, self-expression, competition, altruism, everybody's got one. My usual example for this, and I think you're gonna get this from the discussions that were on in the very beginning of the day, the difference is between two cultures. I'm gonna talk about Israel versus Germany, okay? In Israel, um, actually I'll go German first. Germany is status oriented. They like their cars, they like their watches, they like their clothes. If you have a startup and you failed, you will never get funding again. They are completely afraid of failure. Failure is a bad word. And so they don't take risks. All of their companies are me too's. Okay, almost all. Nearly all of their companies are Me Too's. Only now are there a couple VCs who have had multiple exits who are trying to fix this in the, in, the, in the country. But this is the attitude. And parents are trying to get their kids to, you know, go to an enterprise job. And the newspapers are talking about our economy's too good and that's why we have no innovation. Okay, um, so that would be Germany. Israel, on the other hand, is achievement oriented. We've got over 60% higher education. Um, we've got over 60% higher education. If you've had an exit, the first question somebody is asking you is when you're doing your next startup. There is no getting an exit, having enough money where you never have to work again and not working again. People would think you're insane. Is there something wrong with you? Why would you, what, you're gonna stay, you're gonna do what? You're gonna go rest, you're gonna travel? You're not gonna travel. You can travel for six months, but then it gets boring. You have to come back and start, go back to work again. Okay, this is Israel. So, you know, if you've failed at your startup, well, did you achieve funding? Did you achieve a product? Did you learn from it? When are you doing your next one? That's what they, when are you doing your next one? And that's it. And the question's always asking me, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing your own startup? It's, you know, it's always, why aren't you going to achieve more? And, and that's the difference between the two cultures. It's the difference between the mindset. And the reason why I talk about this is not because of a good or bad thing, but because you have to understand the mindset of your customer. And if your customer is status-oriented, you're going to talk to them in a status-oriented way. And if your customer is achievement-oriented, you're going to talk to them in an achievement way because they're going to respond to that, okay? Mercedes is a status vehicle. And the slide I showed you right before was achievement, okay? So you have to think to yourself, what is your customer? And then build things appropriately. This is the last slide on steroids. I'm not going through it. Go to the website, it's a rabbit hole you will never come out of. Okay, The Hook. <laughs> this is a book by Nir Eyal. He's amazing. If you don't know the book, I highly recommend it. And I'm gonna talk about my personal addiction to Pinterest. So, um, I have a blog, I had a blog about interior design for about three years because I love interior design. So they wrote to me and they said, were you willing to try Pinterest? So I tried Pinterest and that was the external trigger. So in the very beginning, you're gonna do things that don't scale and that will be writing one to one to one to say bloggers in, who write about interior design to see if they'd be interested in trying your product, in this case, Pinterest. So that's the external trigger. The action is me going into the website, okay? The variable reward all the pictures on the page, and I like some of them, but I don't like all of them. And every time I see one that I really love, I get a dopamine rush. 
And that's what happens whenever you get a like, or when you've ever got a heart on Instagram, or any of these different things on the different uh, platforms that you've got, all the different social networks. So you get a dopamine rush. And then you start to get addicted to that dopamine rush. So that's a variable reward. I find something I like, I get a dopamine rush. The investment is the time that I spend on it. Then it goes back, and I get an email, again, saying somebody's like my board, or somebody has pinned one of my pins. I remember about the site. I go back, that's my action, variable reward, love some pictures, pin the pictures, create more boards, that's my time and investment, and it keeps going and going and going, until one morning I wake up and I'm like, I wanna see pretty pictures, and I go onto Pinterest without even having to get an email to remind me about it, and now I look at it daily, because I'm completely addicted. Okay, now this is something to watch later. User onboarding, this is an amazing resource. If you can't get people into your product, you're going to have a problem. Watch user, look at user onboarding, it's basically a UX site. This is the same thing for mobile. Engineering social proof, this is fantastic. So, happy, confused, unhappy. If you're happy, write a review. If you're confused, here's information on the site, or on the, on the product. And if you're unhappy, please contact us. They don't give you the option of writing a review if you're unhappy. <laughs> okay. So it, how you build things matters. And here's another one. Ask for reviews inside of the liner notes. If somebody likes, nobody reads these, okay? If somebody likes your product so much to see what you've just changed in your latest bug release, ask them for a review because they really like your product. Otherwise, nobody cares. Engineering the path to okay. Now, when you first open up an app and you get a million requests, approve this, approve that, approve the other thing, let's say it's a photo app and they need to be able to access your photos. Only 40% of the people on average are gonna end up saying yes, even though they need to access your photos in order to be able to use the photo app. And then having to fix that later is a complete pain. So what do you end up doing? You have to do it where they're actually doing the action, and it's from that action that they end up saying yes. Here's another example of basically the same thing. You could read these later. But it's user triggered. User triggered gives you a higher conversion rate. Engineering viral, how many of you know the Dropbox? Yes. Good, don't need to go there. Okay, how you say things matters. How you say things matters. What you say and how you say them. People listen. Um, okay, emotional triggers. You could read this later, because I've got nine minutes left. Cognitive resources. Do you understand what cognitive resources are? Cognitive resources, how much brain power you have, okay? If you haven't had a lot of sleep and you're exhausted, you can't think. If you've been with the kids all day, oh, forget it. Um, on the other hand, if you're really well rested and you worked out in the morning and you've had a good breakfast, you're raring to go, you've got a lot of cognitive resources. Now you have to think, who's using your product? At what time of day are they using your product? And is this something that they need to be led through by the hand or can they figure it out themselves? So you've got different cognitive resources at different time of the day. They found, they did research and found that judges were more likely to put harsher sentences on people later in the day. So if you ever find yourself in that situation, pray you're checked in the morning and not in the late evening. Um, because cognitive resources, they're more fresh and they're more likely to look at something with a positive point of view. As our day goes on, our mood goes down. And then you need to keep in touch. Make sure that people actually remember who you are and what you're doing. Email marketing has the highest ROI of all digital marketing. I'm going to repeat this. Email marketing has the highest ROI of all digital marketing, ROI being return on investment. Why is that? Well, because you're going directly into somebody's inbox. I'm going to assume that you did not buy a list and that they actually opted in for the email, okay? So they're more likely to look at it. Um, another thing to think about, um, plain text emails are more likely to end up in the primary tag of Google of Gmail, okay? So you may not want to do all the fancy graphics on it because that could end up in the promotions tab. And then keeping in touch when it comes to Android and iOS, and of course also Windows, um, you know, you've got so many different characters that you can use, you wanna keep it short, you wanna test the time of day that you write to people because they'll respond, different people will respond to different times of day. Um, engineering the good feelings. You see that heart? Dopamine rush. The list here of the notifications, dopamine rush. Know your market. This was a video that Dropbox did, 
and it got, they were expecting a couple hundred people their first day. They got over 5,000. Now realize this was a long time ago. That 5,000 was a really big deal. They put it on a dig, and it went viral for those days. And it, you know, it was something that just really spoke to their market. So when you know your market, it's a lot easier for you to say what they're looking for, and you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money to do it. How many of you have seen the Dollar Shave Club video? Okay, a few of you. For those of you who haven't, go to YouTube after, well, actually after the whole conference, and watch this video, you'll thank me. It's really funny. Um, he has a background in improv. It cost him 5,000 bucks. He has an, a background in improv. He did social seating for video uh, before he started his company. It cost, you know, he also lives in Hollywood. So to do a video like this, it is possible to do when you've got all of the right, net, when you've got the right network effects. But from Slovenia, it's gonna be a lot harder. So I would aim more for this than that, because this is really hard to do. The other thing is, of course, if you do this and your product isn't where it should be, you're dead. You will not get the people to come back. Watch your funnel. This is critical, okay? Every stage, acquisition, conversion, retention, and either buys and then word of mouth, or word of mouth and then buys. It just depends on where you have people in their funnel. And this is a brand new resource from my friend uh, Michael Yurasek, Okay, can't pronounce his name properly. And it's, he's calling it the Startup Funnel Board, but what it really is, is a sales funnel canvas. And so you could use this resource. Um, the URL is up there, and again, you'll be able to see it on the tab. And it's a way to go through and map out if your sales funnel is where it should be. God, I'm not even gonna be able to get to be uh, mobile. Okay, build an app family, localization, make sure that, oh, this is not actually a real, uh, okay, so it turns out that the Chevy Nova, this is actually on Snopes. This didn't really happen, but I actually learned about it in my undergraduate degree in marketing class. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been an urban myth for a really long time, and I'm still going with it because I like the example. Um, in Spanish, if Nova, well, Nova does mean no go, but it was supposedly that sales were really bad because the localization was done improperly. So think to yourself, if you are a German company, you're gonna be doing a product in Spain, don't have the user that you're using as an example named Hans. Okay, uh, branding. We all like the pretty. We don't like ugly. We like pretty. Do pretty. Best pictures of the app. <laughs> okay, best pictures of the app. Um, make sure that text is below. It's really just app store optimization, so you can put some stuff there. Most people don't read it. Social proof is critical, and B2B. This you could look at afterwards, but it's just an amazing resource. It tells you all these different ways to get people in, okay? Because you want to see the funnel. Read that after, read that after. Uh, communicating to an international market. American is not the same as English, is not the same as Australian, is not the same as New Zealand, is not the same as South African. Okay, even if it's English. We don't all use the same words, we don't use the same slang, we don't use the same pronunciation. We don't, Americans don't use use the way that the English do. So you wanna make sure that you're writing for the area that you live or are aiming for as your target market. International partnerships, you're in Europe, use it. Okay, I know that it's, um, that being here, it's a little bit harder than say, if you're based in Silicon Valley. But on the other hand, if you get enough international partnerships, together you can get yourselves into a pretty big market. Um, thought leadership, when it comes to B2B, being thought as a thought leader builds trust, builds reciprocity, makes people more likely to invest in your product. Okay, so they wanna know that you know what you're, th what you're doing. And thought leadership is the way you show that. Getting mentioned in articles, writing posts yourself, showing what you have in your brain. Marketing is more of a sales tool, okay? It's what the sales guys use in order to get the sale done. Social media is for research. You look up things and you see what the mood is in the market, things like that. Reportive, how many of you know what Reportive is? One. Okay, so Reportive is a plugin for Gmail. And um, you could put in somebody's email. In this case, it was my editor at the next web, Martin, uh, and it shows you, as soon as you get the right email, all of his details show up on the side. Okay, that's how you know how the right person. It's owned by LinkedIn. Boomerang, uh, this gets the reminders that you sent out an email to somebody, they didn't end up writing back to you, the email comes back into your inbox. 
signals. This tells you when somebody opened it. Hey, did you get that email from me? I didn't get it. Oh, really? So, <sighs> LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an amazing resource. Getting to people there is great. Um, Rory Sutherland is amazing. He's a behavioral economist and, uh, and he's vice chairman at Ogilvy. And so I joined a group that he was in in order to be able to send him a request. Um, if you're looking for somebody, you need to cold call and you need to find out their last name. You know their title. You have a general idea of who you're looking for. Well, LinkedIn doesn't show it to you. So what you do is you do a Google search for all their details. Michael, founder, builder, Everlane, LinkedIn. There you go. Boom, last name. And there it is. Uh, I like reviews, right on time. I like reviews, so there are two. I recommend reading them afterwards, they're really funny. And that's it. So, if and, any more, there's gotta be more questions. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, how can you go viral on YouTube? Oh, how do you go viral on YouTube? Okay, so, going viral on YouTube. First of all, you have to have, well, I mean, I could tell you. Kittens, babies. <laughs> okay, um, and but it's it's more important. It's more important to go to the right market than go after vanity metrics, which actually we'll be talking about in the next panel session. Um, so what you want to do is figure out have have you seen have you seen the videos? Will it blend? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It it fits their market perfectly. It goes viral. It's simple and it doesn't cost a lot in order to make the video. So that, in my opinion, if you can create something like that for whatever product you have, you know, then you've got something. Um, on the other hand, if you're just giving out really helpful information and then you post it on your blog and different social channels and it's something that somebody really needs and they're searching for it, you'll get found. Um, here's a hint, when you're doing YouTube, you wanna make sure that the file name is also like all the keywords that you um, want people to find you for. Because, because it's a video and it's not text, it's harder for uh, Google to SEO it. So that's how you help yourself go along. So the file name should be the keywords. Should also, all the keywords, it basically should also be the title. So the keywords and the title should be, um, have your, or the title and the file name should have all the keywords in it. Other question, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you were mentioning email marketing and you said actually twice that it's really important. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, do you think that uh, email marketing is uh, being compromised now by notifications from the social network that is coming? Mm. Uh, what, what I mean that uh, whenever I uh, log in to some social network, mm -hmm. I put the email address uh, the same for the newsletters. It's like the one that I read later. So uh, being the social market being such, such a big uh, market now? So, um, I think that most people when they go, well, I don't know actually, I'm a kind of a super user, but I think that a lot of people when they go on a social network, they categorize, or they, they go through the permissions and decide what they want to get emails on and not get emails on. Um, also, that was the reason why I said make it just plain text. It'll get more likely to get into the primary tab on your Gmail. Most people do use Gmail these days. So it's more likely to get into your primary Gmail tab than get into a promotions tab. Um, on the other hand, all of the social channels have a different tab. They have the social tab. So um, that's, that's the way to get the hack for that to work. And I'm out of time, so you can find me after. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.